When I learned to scuba dive, I had just one question for my dive instructor. What do you do if you see a shark underwater? He said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's all that I'd been worried about. But that was nearly 20 years ago. And I've been lucky enough since then to dive around the world alongside dozens of different species of sharks. And you know what? He was absolutely right. In the company of sharks, I've never felt fear or concern or panic. Instead, I've only felt calm and joy and reverence. If you've ever seen a lion on safari, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But if a new diver came to me today and asked me the same question that I had way back when, I know that I would tell them this. Don't worry about seeing a shark. Worry about never seeing a shark. You see, I've become increasingly concerned at how the man-eating myth has become bigger than the truth and the disastrous consequences of hanging on to that belief. The conservationist Baba Dion says, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we're taught. Think about that for a second. What have you ever been taught about sharks? Whatever you're thinking, I know that you're not alone. At the end of 2017, a piece of research was done into the British public's attitudes towards sharks and the oceans. And I'd like to share with you two standout statistics. The first is this. Nearly half of all Brits think that sharks are more terrifying than snakes, spiders, and rodents combined. But more worrying for me is the fact that 64% of Brits would prefer sharks not to exist. So today I'd really like to tell you why I think sharks are so unloved, why some sharks are on the brink of extinction, and why, for the sake of life on Earth, we have to change our attitudes towards sharks. But if you're one of the 64%, it's probably easy to explain in just one word why you're terrified of sharks. Jaws. <laughs> Now, it might seem really cliched to point the finger at a 1975 movie, but it does seem to be the moment when the Western world collectively screamed, get out of the water. And it's not my ambition to point the blame or levy the blame for this universal fear and loathing of sharks at the doorstep of Peter Benchley, who wrote the book wearing the check shirt, or indeed, if you recognize him, a very young Steven Spielberg in the middle who directed the movie. But I think we can all be agreed on this. That movie terrified us. But if 1975 was the moment in time when sharks were first globally portrayed as man-eating monsters, how come four decades later, nearly half of all Brits are still terrified of sharks? Well, here's what I think. Jaws never died. Now that's not a clever premise for Jaws 5 and 6, <laughs> but what I really mean to tell you is that I think the media has kept Jaws alive. After all, you will have all seen headlines like this. And this. Now, it seems to me that if you're a journalist, you can't write about sharks without using words stolen from the book. It seems that there's an unwritten law that you must write about sharks using words like killer, man-eater, menacing, razor-toothed beast. And by my finger in the air calculation, barely three days go by between headlines like this. And I think it's just often enough to keep the myth alive. And to back up my claim, here are just a few headlines from the first two weeks of this year. 
Can you see the theme? But here's the thing. Jaws wasn't a documentary. <laughs> On average, British cows kill more people than all the sharks in the world combined. <laughs> in fact, last year, hundreds more people died from toasters, from dog bites, from bee stings, from lightning strikes. Incredibly, more people last year died from falling vending machines and from taking selfies without paying proper attention. <laughs> we just never seem to see those headlines. And I think those headlines have created a blind spot in the mind of the public when it comes to shark conservation. And I'd go as far as to say that I think those headlines have legitimised the mass slaughter of sharks. You see, just 1% of Brits had any idea that 73 million sharks are killed every year. 73 million sharks. That means that global fishing fleets are heading out to sea and they're catching around 200,000 sharks every day. That's two every second. And nature can't keep up. And the primary reason that they're catching sharks so fast has a lot to do with this. Shark fin soup. The popularity of this dish has skyrocketed. And as a result, shark fins have become one of the most valuable seafood items on the planet. And it has created a marine gold rush for sharks. But there's a sinister twist to this. Shark fins are worth a great deal of money. Shark meat, considerably less so. And that's a fact that isn't lost on many unscrupulous fishermen who, rather than pay for the fuel to bring an entire shark carcass back to port, instead choose to take the valuable bits. In a practice known as shark finning, they would bring the shark to the boat and then systematically hack off its dorsal fin, its pectoral fins, and its tail fin before throwing it overboard to die a long, lingering death. As far as I'm concerned, this is the marine equivalent of killing an elephant for its tusks. And as a result, in some parts of the world, iconic species of sharks, like the hammerhead, the thresher, the oceanic white tip, and the silky, have seen their numbers depleted by about 80 to 90% in some parts of the world. But let me tell you two more examples of how I think the deck is stacked against sharks closer to home. And the first is this. Right now, there are no EU or international catch limits for most sharks caught in the Atlantic. Of course, there are quotas for tuna and hake and halibut, but none for sharks. This mismanagement of the oceans has allowed Spain to become the third largest shark fishing nation in the world. The second example is somewhat more quirky. But as I explain, I'm sure you'll agree that this couldn't occur to any other apex predator in the world. When you travel back into Europe from abroad, you have a personal import allowance. Most of you will know uh, that that's the ruling that allows you to bring a litre of spirits and 200 cigarettes through customs without looking guilty. But that same ruling also allows you to bring 20 kilos of shark fins. It will have been derived from 25, uh, 25 sharks, will make 705 bowls of soup, and it will have a black market value of around £3,500. So I think... Things are stacked against sharks. We have a public fear and loathing. We've got media reports that are nothing but sensational. And then we have loopholes in the law like this. But if you're one of the 64%, here's the terrifying truth about sharks. We need them. We need them because for 450 million years, they have been shaping our oceans since before the dinosaurs walked the earth. We need them because they're apex predators and they sit at the top of a fragile marine food web. 
The theme of today's talks is out of order, and scientists say that if we carry on catching sharks at this colossal rate, it will throw the underwater world into chaos. And worst case scenario is that we will lose all the familiar seafood that the world relies upon as a source of protein. Worst case scenario is that the oceans become dominated by jellyfish. And there's a very real chance that the oceans will turn green. Algae blooms will smother the ocean's ability to produce oxygen and absorb CO2. In fact, please will you all join me in consciously taking two deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. Are you ready? Well, certainly the oxygen in your first breath will have come from the rainforests, from plants and trees and vegetation. And the oxygen in your second breath will certainly have come from the oceans, specifically plankton, kelp and seagrass. Now, I can tell you that a square metre of seagrass will produce 10 litres of oxygen a day. And it can absorb 35 times more CO2 than an equivalent patch of rainforest. If you were one of the 12 million people that tuned into Blue Planet 2, you may remember a sequence whereby just the mere presence of sharks kept turtles on their toes and stopped them from overgrazing important areas of seagrass. So David Attenborough told us, so it would seem that the prairies and their sharks are surprising allies in the fight against a warming climate. So, if we mess with sharks, we mess with the oceans. And if we mess with the oceans, we mess with the lungs and the larder of the planet. As the National Geographic Ocean Explorer in Residence, Dr. Sylvia Earle so succinctly said, no blue, no green. If the oceans die, we die. Strong words, I know. But when I see those words, I see a challenge, a challenge to protect the lions and the leopards of the ocean. Because if you want to protect the oceans, you have to start with sharks. And the best bit, it's not too late. Around the world, brilliant organizations are already putting a squeeze on a billion dollar shark fishing industry. And I'm proud to tell you that in the UK, the charity that I launched in Kingston, called Bite Back, is well on its way to making Britain the first country in the world to ban shark fin soup. Now, they say that Britain is a nation of animal lovers, and I would love to see that include sharks, because the survey came back and it told us that 90% of Brits had no idea that we have more than 30 species of sharks in our waters, including this, the basking shark. One in three people didn't know about this, and I think that's such a shame, because this gentle giant is as long as this stage. It has a mouth as wide as a sofa, but it only eats plankton. Then we've got this. It's the Mako shark. It's the fastest shark in the world, clocked at speeds of over 30 miles an hour. And we have this, the poor beagle shark, which is possibly the closest thing that we have to the great white. This is our nature. This is our heritage. This is ours to protect. Now here's possibly a little known fact. In response to the bloodthirsty backlash that sharks experienced in the wake of Jaws, Peter Benchley said this, Knowing what I know now, I could never write that book today. And Peter spent a lot of the rest of his life defending sharks. At the beginning of my talk, I asked you what you'd been taught about sharks. And I now hope that you'll know this. Sharks are less deadly than vending machines. <laughs> that when journalists write about sharks, 
They use jaws as a thesaurus. That every second breath that you take comes from the oceans. And I hope that you'll remember this. For the sake of life on Earth, we need sharks. And I really hope that you hang on to that thought and share it with your friends. Because I think the future of sharks lies in your hands. After all, the ocean's most deadly predator is sitting in your seat. Thank you.